Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My name is Ethan Fordham. I serve as a, an elder here at Renovation Church. Grateful to have everyone here with us this morning and to continue our series uh, through Genesis. Oh, kids are dismissed. Go ahead. Go downstairs. I always forget. We always forget, don't we? They don't. The kids don't forget. Yeah, <laughs> they know what to do. Uh, <laughs> in 1997, Frank Costanza served mankind. He served mankind by offering up an alternative to the Christmas to Christmas, a festivus for the rest of us. I am in the wrong book, forgive me. <laughs> I should have had it open before. I'm in Exodus 9, not Genesis 9. Frankenstein, this is what he is. He gives us a festivus for the rest of us. And uh, on December 23rd, the date that festivus is to be celebrated, Frank Costanza began the celebration by opening up and saying, the tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people, and now you're going to hear about it. Right? The airing of grievances. If you know, you know. If you don't, it's an episode of Seinfeld. And please do yourself a favor and uh, watch Seinfeld. <laughs> What are you doing with your life? Uh, but airing of grievances. Sometimes as Christians, this is how we want to react to the sins of people around us, isn't it? We just want to air our grievances. Maybe we, we bottle up our sins throughout the year for a special occasion upon which we can explode in front of them. But is that how... We deal or should react to the sins of the people around us by simply airing our grievances against them. Even more importantly, is that how God responds to us? I think as we continue through our series in Genesis this morning, we have a couple questions to ask as we approach this text. What do we do in response to the sins of others? And what does God do with sinful humanity? These are the questions that we're asking as we come to Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 through 29. Open up your Bibles there. It'll be on the screen. Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 through 29. This is the word of the Lord. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. And he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Let's go before the Lord and ask for his assistance this morning in prayer. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, illumine the sacred page, we pray, 
that our minds may be open to receive your word, our hearts taught to love it, and our wills strengthened to obey it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. I'm sure many people here have done uh, family trees, right? You ever done a family tree? I'm sure lots of people have done family trees. I've never done one. I have absolutely no idea where I come from. Uh, But I'm sure many of you have done family trees. What's interesting with a a family tree, the way that we do them, is we start with ourselves, and then we work backwards. What's interesting about biblical genealogies is that they work the exact opposite. They work forward. And that's exactly what we see in these opening words. As the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, come out of the ark, and it says, the whole earth, from them the whole earth dispersed. That whatever is happening here, we see that the entire human race is about to come from Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Whatever happens with these three sons is in many ways setting the stage for the rest of human history. And there's something in this that's very Genesis 2, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, about this whole situation. right? The, the, the flood was a type of worldwide judgment on sin that rehearsed the original creation. If you remember, God caused the creation to come out of the water, and in the flood as the waters recede, we see that a new creation is coming out of the flood. This opening scene just smacks of of new creation language. We we might even be coming to this text and thinking, okay, God's judged sin. Maybe sin's done and over with. Maybe Noah is the promised seed that the Lord told Adam and Eve would come and reversed sin, Satan, and death. Maybe, Maybe this is it. And if you continue, right, we see maybe like a little bit more hope. We read that Noah began to be a man of the soil. Does that sound familiar? It kind of sounds like Adam. Adam was a man created from the the ground, from the soil, for the soil to cultivate the world. We see that Noah now is beginning to live out God's commission in the garden. Okay, all right. Commit commission again. We're doing it. New creation, new work. Let's go, Noah. He begins... He begins to be a man of the soil. And in this, we see that he plants a vineyard and he makes wine. I don't know. I mean, what kind of wine was it like? What kind of grapes were those, you know? It was definitely a red wine, in my opinion, my humble opinion. It was definitely a red wine, right? But he, he makes wine. He plants a vineyard. He plants a garden, right? Think about that. For a second, a man comes out of a newly created world, works the ground, and cultivates a garden. This is a rehearsal of Genesis 2. This is new creation language. What high hopes and expectation, right, just in these couple of verses. Oh, man, like God's done it again, except things are better now right? Unfortunately, no. You already know the answer to that. We read the text trying to build tension, but anyways, unfortunately, no. Because just as, right, like, I always knock into that, right? God created the world. He created Adam, but what happens? Adam falls, and unfortunately, we see here a second fall. That Noah makes this wine, and he gets drunk on his produce, and he passes out naked on the living room floor. He passes out naked on the living room floor, right? This is disappointing, right? After all that, after the flood, 
the saving of these few people, all of these animals, only for Noah to fall into the sin of drunkenness? For it to all seem to unravel, it seemed we were doing so well, Noah. The reality is, is that sin is still in the world, and even righteous Noah isn't exempt from it. I think our own lives are like this, right? That in Jesus Christ, what does Paul say? In him, we are made a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. But if we've been a Christian for more than 30 seconds, we realize very quickly that there's still so much sin in us and in those around us. We see that Noah shows us that even the most pious and righteous people are still subject to sin in this life. Friend, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, let's not be surprised that we still sin and that people around us still sin. That we sin is a disappointing reality of living in a fallen world. But like we began, as the people of God, it matters what we do in response to the sin of others. And we see how Noah's sons respond to the sin of their father. We continue. It says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. This is kind of odd. I've been saying this all week. The point of this text is actually quite simple. It's just such an odd text to make this point with. But we come to this, and, and Ham has seen his father naked, and then he goes outside, and he tells his brothers. This is odd. We're like, what's the big deal? He saw his dad naked. Surely it's unpleasant. But is it sin? Well, if we remember from the garden... Seeing nakedness, being aware of it, was associated with the entrance of sin into the world. That nakedness was now accompanied by shame. That Noah's drunkenness led to a shameful act that produced a shameful and sinful response in Ham. And instead of honoring and helping his father, Ham saw his father naked on the floor and delighted in his humiliation. And I think that is indicated in the fact that he went and he, he told his brothers, instead of honoring his father, by just helping him. He, went and he told his brothers to get them to enter into the mocking and the humiliation of his father. Ham's fault was that he responded to his father's sin with more sin. Ham dishonored his father by delighting in his downfall and tried to welcome his brothers to do the same. It could be that way sometimes. I remember even just working sometimes where you work with people that just are annoying and maybe terrible at their job, and instead of being helpful, like you just want to welcome in the sort of like m the misery of others into that, right? Like misery loves company. Look at how much we can't stand this other person we work with. I'm confessing that sin right now, right? To commiserate with, with uh, coworkers. It's unrighteous. We do that sometimes with those people around us. Instead of helping, we just sort of delight in people's sin and downfall. The question is, 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 what does Shem and Japheth do? We see that they didn't follow their brother. They didn't. Though Ham went and tried to wrap them up in it, they didn't do that. They didn't hold their father's sin against him, but treated him with honor. We read, Then Shem and Japheth took a garment 
laid it on both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. Shem and Japheth reversed Ham's sin. They did the very opposite of what he did. They didn't take any risk. You can kind of imagine the sort of image, right? They just taken right walk backwards and plop it on their dad. They honored their dad. They honored their father. Not by humili- not by humiliating him or delighting in his downfall, but by protecting him and covering his sin. They honored and loved their father by covering his sin. I don't know about you, but I'm glad these elder brothers took it upon themselves to protect their father when he was in sin's weakness and vulnerability. It reminds me a lot of another elder brother who took it upon himself to cover our sin with his precious blood. Does it not? Friends, what do we see? What do we, and it's such an odd story. Can we just confess that right now? It's such an odd story. But what do we do to deal and respond to the sin of others? Friends, when we still sin, let's cover one another's sin with love. Proverbs 10, 12 says this. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Or 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sin. Right? There's something, there's something godlike in this action, something divine, something so much like Christ. Right? When Adam and Eve sinned, God did not delight in their downfall. Instead, he promised to undo their sin, and he sealed the promise with, his blo- with blood, right? Remember when Adam and Eve, they, they, they covered their naked shame with fig leaves, right? By their own works, Adam and Eve tried to cover up their own sins. But God came in, made a promise, and he covered them with the skins of sacrificed animals, making a promise to them. God didn't delight in Adam and Eve's downfall. He covered their sin, and he made them a promise. Friends, in this second fall, Shem and Japheth honored their father by covering his shame instead of delighting and mocking him for his sin. I think it's important to note that covering someone's sin does not mean sweeping it under the rug as if we could just sort of like, poof, it's all, oh, don't, like, we just don't worry about it, sin. Unfortunately, I know people who have been in unfortunate church circumstances where people will sweep sin under the rug because of Jesus even though in the very gospel itself, God does not sweep our sins under the rug because he actually meets justice's demands by meeting out his wrath on Jesus Christ on our behalf. God doesn't ignore sin. Therefore, as the church, we should not ignore sin. Covering sin is not the same as covering it up in the ways that we think about things being covered up in the world these days. The question is, when you see the sins of others, do we delight in their failure and downfall, or do we mourn their sin and seek restoration? Seek restoration. And when a brother or sister sins, we do not want to delight in their downfall, in their failures, right? We see it in the world around us, 
everywhere right now. And it's an unpleasant name, but it literally has a name. It's called failure porn, where people get obsessed with the failures of others. And they just delight in them screwing up. Friends, that is not how we deal with sin, either in ourselves or others. I even say the sins of other, of other people who maybe aren't even Christians. Friends, when a brother or sister sins, we should cover them with the love of Christ and restore them in his name. This is what God does to us. This is what we should do to one another. That when a brother or sister sins, this is another important thing to note, it can mean, restoration can mean receiving punishment and accepting consequences. I'm going to put a big target on my back as a pastor, right? Because there are men in ministry today that should not be. Men who have utterly disqualified themselves. Who should, who, men who did things they ought not to have done. But who have been restored by other people. Restored, of course, for these men means that they get to get up and preach. I think that this is an utter mistake. Restoration for some of these men needs to be that they just sit in the pew. That they just receive the abundance of grace found in the preaching of God's word to them. And that they get welcome to the table. If I get disqualified, I don't want to be up here. I want to be right there. And it's a shame when sin gets covered up this way and disqualified men get platformed so easily. I think when that happens, we miss out on the real grace that even when we sin, right, God restores us still just to be his children. Just to be simple Christians. Just to set up some chairs. Just to receive the word and the supper. If I fall into sin, friends, I want you to know that that's grace enough for me. I'll be content to find another job. Brothers and sisters, when Noah and his sons emerged from the ark into a new create, they emerged from the ark into a new creation. But this new creation was still affected by sin. In Christ, we are new creations, still affected by sin. So, what do we do with this sin? In response to this sin, friends, when we still sin, let's honor one another with the love that covers a multitude of sins. Amen? We continue. Let's look at verses 24 through 29. It says, When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. His ser- a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, And let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. We read that Noah regained his composure. He woke up, and he realized what Ham had done, right? And he utters, and he realizes too, that what Ham had done, and then what his other two sons had done. And so he utters a curse and two promises, He says, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. Noah utters a curse against his grandson, against Ham's son, right? Like, I don't know, dad's here. If you wake up from a nap and you find out something that your children had done and you're just like, what did you do? Like, you might be like, it's like, okay, hang on, maybe it's not a big deal, but 
right? We, we think about what's going on with Noah here. We might be like, Noah, slow your horse. What's happening right now? Why are you cursing your grandson all of a sudden? I think it's important to see, right, that what Noah is doing is not a reaction in anger. He's not lashing out, sort of frustrated and wrathful against his son or his grandson. Rather, Noah wakes up and he speaks prophetically in the spirit of prophecy. And in this curse on Canaan, what he's saying is, Ham, your son Canaan, he's going to be just like you. Like father, like son. He's going to be just like you. The Canaanites, your children, will become idolatrous and wicked people, just like their father Canaan, or like their father Ham. So God allotted to his descendants the lowest position possible, a servant of servants, which is a really just a soft way of saying a slave of slaves. And in this, two things need to be said. In the history of biblical interpretation, starting around the 18th century, but basically completely unknown before that, was a way of interpreting this text that said that Ham was Noah's dark-skinned son. And that the fulfillment of this curse was met out in the enslavement of African people. If you've heard, I grew up hearing that, if I'm being honest. I grew up hearing that. Three of the commentaries that I read this week said that. This was, in the history of biblical interpretation, a purely novel and evil way of trying to justify the unjustifiable, trying to justify the wickedness and the sin and the evil practice of enslavement. Even though we read in the rest of, the, both, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that there are two things that were totally and utterly condemned, that the Israelites were not permitted to do and that the church was not permitted to do. Two things, steal people and sell them. Straight up, just condemned in the scriptures. So much so that I think it was the Slaves Bible they actually removed some of those verses because they knew. They knew how wrong they were. I just want to say, that's not what this text is saying. It is not saying that. And the use of this text to justify that is a great sin and stain on some who bore the name Christian in church history. So what is it saying? What we do read is that it was the character of Ham, of Canaan, of the people that determined their future. And this reminded me, as I was thinking about this this morning, the way Augustine, in the 4th or 5th century, defined free will. He said, free will is the freedom to do what you want. The freedom to do what you want. I agree with that definition. I think that's a great definition. People have the freedom to do what they want, to express the desires that reside in their hearts. And what we're seeing in Ham, in Canaan, is that this family line is going to be, they're going to exemplify the desires of their hearts, that their character was determining their future. Their character made them a cursed 
people. Alan Ross commenting on, on, on this said, the point is that nationally, at least, drunkenness and debauchery enslave people. And the pattern of debauchery continues unless halted by faith. We might just say that's a cycle of sin. That sin cycles exist. That sin enslaves and it causes, causes sin that enslaves more. And what we see, too, in these words concerning Canaan is that they're fulfilled, right, in the rest of the Old Testament. That the Canaanites themselves were, were indeed slaves to a bunch of the people around them. That they were indeed slaves to the people around them. And that eventually, when Israel come in, comes in and conquers the land, the Canaanites who remained after the conquest, the, the def, their, some of them were defeated in battle, that there remained some alive who became antagonists, right, to the people of God. We see that struggle over and over and over again in the book of Judges. But we also see that by God's grace, some of these Canaanites are brought into the people of God, brought into Israel, like Rahab, the prostitute, and Jericho, and Joshua, that Rahab, when she lied, hid the Israelite spies, she becomes a part of the people of God. And you know whose genealogy she's in? She's in Jesus' genealogy. Jesus even comes from this Canaanite woman, woman. The reality is that when people still sin, though, God must still judge sin. He must still judge them. God must defend his honor and his holiness. And because God is good, he must judge sin. He must judge sin. sin. And sometimes that judgment comes in this life. Judgment was being met out on the Canaanites in real time. Sometimes it means this life. Sometimes it doesn't, which are sometimes the hardest. When we're like, God, where are you? When are you, are you gonna do something about this, like the Pol Pots and the Stalins and the Lenins and the Hitlers, like probably less than that, less. Sometimes that when, when we don't see justice in this life is when we have the hardest time, but we know for certain that in the next life, how does God deal with sin? Well, he does judge it and he must because he's good, and because he's just. But he does not do so without making promises. He doesn't do so without making promises. This is something that Calvin said on this. He says, the thing to be here observed is the comparison instituted between punishment and grace by which we are taught that God, while he is a just avenger of crimes, is still more inclined to mercy. In prophetic declaration, Noah says to Shem and Japheth, right? He says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Right? The, this is good news. That even after all the sin that's occurred, we see God respond in his favor and his grace. That despite sin, God is going to still be faithful to save people. Right? Shem, you know who's Great, 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 great grandfather. I don't know how many greats it was. I didn't bother counting. Great grandfather, he was? He was the great, great grandfather of Abram, of Abraham. This promise made to Shem 
is the promise that he's going to save a people through his line, through his lineage, and the coming of Abraham. That Abraham, the, the father of God's promises, right? The father of God's promises. That Shem's descendants are blessed because God is going to make them his people. And if you right, remember that Genesis is being is composed by Mo, uh, composed by Moses before the people of Israel are going to go into the land of Canaan, right? Probably around the time that he's also giving the law a second time in the book of Deuteronomy, and they're about to go into the land, and they've already failed. Right, the previous generation already failed to go into the land because they saw the Canaanites, and they were afraid. But what we see here, right, Moses is basically giving them an origin story for their enemies. And he's saying, listen, because of what happened before, you can rest assured that the Canaanites are already a defeated enemy. They're already defeated. And what's even more profound and astounding, even though this curse is given through Canaan, but you know some of the other famous names? In the line of Ham? Egypt. Assyria. Babylon. From Ham, the origin story of all of God's enemies. So what is God saying? God is saying, don't worry. Go into the land. Your enemies are already defeated. Your enemies are already defeated. Right? This is good news for the people of Israel. And it's good news for Japheth, right? His descendants will be blessed because they'll dwell in the tents of Shem. Well, we know, who, right? We just talked about who the Shemites are, the Israelites. So who are the Japh Japhethites, right? Who, who are they? Who are these people that are going to one day dwell with the people of God in the tent of Shem to receive the promises and the blessings of Abraham? Friends, in time, when the promises made to Abraham were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, is when the promises of Abraham came to the Gentiles, right? And the Gentiles were saved, right? Anybody who's not a Jew, right? Where there no promise of, right? We think they're not the people of God. The people of God received the promises, right? But here we see God promising that the Gentiles are gonna be brought into the people of God, that in Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile is brought into one common faith, that Jesus Christ came into the world and he set up a bigger tent, a tent for both Jew and Gentile, where the dividing wall of hostility is torn down, and those who are aliens and strangers to the covenants of promise become the people of God right? That God still saves, right? Even when we still sin, God still saves and brings us into his family, into his tent. That when Jesus died, rose again, and ascended into heaven, he set up the tent of his body, the church. And this, friends, right? What is this tent that we dwell in? It's Jesus Christ. What's this tent that we dwell in? What might we call it? We might call it a tent of justification and forgiveness of sins. A tent of adoption and belonging to the family of God as brothers and sisters in Jesus. A, a tent of renewed life in the spirit, dead no more, but alive in Jesus Christ. A tent of blessed hope in a hopeless world. This is the tent God promised to Japheth. This is the tent that we dwell in. Amen? Friend, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want to call on you, please, flee from sin. Right? 
on account of sin, the wrath of God is coming. And there is only one place, one tent, one house, one family, friends, one person by which every name under heaven will be saved. And that's in Jesus Christ. If you accept him by faith, he will save you from the wrath to come. He will save you because that's God's promise to you. I think even here, as I'm looking and I'm thinking about how the Israelites basically have this promise. Hey, Israel, your enemies, they're already defeated. If you're a Christian here this morning, you struggle with sin. And sin can be a really fearful thing, right? It's really easy to be afraid of sin from with us or the sins of others. Friends, we have a promise here that our sin is an already defeated enemy. That we need not fear the enemies of sin, Satan, and death. Because God promises that an enemy is already defeated. That you, that I, we need not be afraid of sin anymore. So think about our, when we confess sin together as a church, we don't do so with fear. I like Luther made the distinction when he talks about the fear of the Lord. He says there's a difference between servile fear and familial fear. The servant is afraid because of punishment, potentially. But the son and the daughter is afraid because of disappointment. If we fear the Lord, we don't want to disappoint him. So when we confess our sins, we don't come because we think we're going to get punished. No, all of that, right? That enemy that still wages war within us, maybe win some battles, we struggle. We lose sometimes, we fall. God's already won the war. Because right here, at the beginning of this new creation in Noah, when there was still sin, God promised you and me that our sin has already been defeated. Because God has declared it defeated, He's defeated it really, truly in his son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our great hope as the people of God, isn't it? That's our great hope. Friends, when we still sin, God still saves, just like he promised. Simply to wrap up, verse 28 and 29, after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Noah's story might be over, but we know the story wasn't over, right? Another reminder that in, this, in his day, they were still awaiting the fulfillment of God's promises, and friends, just as Noah dies, if the Lord tarries, we also will die. Every one of us in this room will die one day. But we are waiting for a new day when God will make all things new. A day in which we will die no more. A day in which we will feel no fear for a defeated enemy no more. Even though we still sin and suffer death in this life, we can rest assured that the enemies of sin and Satan have already been defeated. Though we die, death is emptied of its power. Friends, when we still sin, when we still sin, emphasis on still, when we still sin, God still saves us. Amen? Let me pray. Merciful and most gracious God, 
your grace is so abundant in the face of so much sin. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, for these great promises you made concerning him on our account. Continue to protect us in this life. Give us great courage in the face of a defeated enemy. Lord, may your righteousness, your goodness, your holiness, your justice, your love reign in this church and in the world around us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.